give me one second. Okay, cool. So uh, going back, okay. So if you are a customer, please uh, post all your questions uh, after the seminar is complete, because if you keep on posting one question one after the other, it would be a bit difficult for me to answer the questions. Uh, post them in the workshop channel itself. For non-customers, you can email them to me, uh, post the workshop itself, and, and I'll uh, be more than happy to answer your questions once the workshop is, uh, the seminar is complete. So uh, why Brute Retail? Uh, one of the first questions that you might ask. And it was the first Red Team framework which was purely built towards uh, evasion and not just simulation. There are a lot of other uh, C2 frameworks, uh, paid and open source, which were built around two, two and a half years. And before that, which was specifically built for adversary emulation. But uh, the aim of Brute Retail was pure evasion. Uh, while providing various different functionalities to make it as OPSEC safe as possible. It has pre-built division features, some of which we will go through uh, as we proceed with the uh, seminar today. It is heavily uh, research oriented and it provides various cutting edge techniques, some of which we will uh, take a look at today as well as we proceed. Uh, we have official support for Evision. Uh, just give me one sec. I think a few people more are requesting to join in. Okay. So it has official support for Evision, and I will be focusing on how uh, Brutal provides support for not only in memory Evisions, but also for Yara as well. And yes, uh, starting from this release, that is V1.7, uh, the version 1.7. There will be full support for Yara support uh, for Yara evasions as well, which I'll be discussing as we proceed today. Uh, we'll also be discussing on the different types of research and development that goes into the product, how to get started uh, with Brute Retail today if you are just a new customer and. Uh, the full support is provided over discord itself so if you are a customer and if you don't have access to the discord channel feel free to ping me up and i'll be more than happy to uh, provide you access to the uh, discord channel over here and it is purely customer oriented and by that i mean that if you are a customer and if you have any kind of feature request or maybe bug support the discord channel is pretty transparent so you can directly post your uh, any report of bugs that you have over there or any feature request that you might have uh, bug reports are usually solved within uh, 24 hours to 48 hours, uh, depending upon how critical the bug is. If it's a feature request, depending upon how complicated the feature is, it can be done within like uh, an hour or sometimes it might take a month, depending upon how complicated that is going to be. So Brutal provides you various out of the box evasion capabilities. Uh, I will be discussing some of them, not all, because um, these evasion capabilities are handled by Brutal itself so that an operator does not necessarily have to focus on them and they can focus more on the post exploitation parts of the product. It does support uh, mitre graphs and it has more than 100 plus uh, post exploitation capabilities built in, which does not use uh, any process creation at all and it uh, tends to evade uh, a ton of different uh, possible detections both in the user land as well as in the kernel as well which we will be discussing it in a few minutes it supports various c2 channels and it has a varied api uh, support uh, which can be used for uh, automating adversary ttps in fact we do have a few customers who focus more on the purple team counterpart and they have used this API to build their own uh, personal web application interface and they don't use commander at all when they work towards Brute Retail. So these are some of the uh, core capabilities of Brute Retail. Uh, we'll be discussing some of them and uh, the ones which require an in-depth explanation, I will con be conducting more workshops as well as i will also be uh, sharing a documentation by the end of this uh, week itself which will uh, contain more and more documentation on how these evasions work and what an operator needs to take care of when they are building their implants in this case regarding evasion support uh, this is how uh, brute Retail provides evasions every major release contains updates on yara rule and I will also explain the different types of Yara rules that are uh, used by uh, EDR or antivirus organizations and how they detect which Yara rules Blue Turtle supports and which is le left out to the operator as well. We'll be discussing on AMSI as well as ETW and .NET reflection as well, user land unhooking, uh, kernel callback evasion, network malleability, and more. So uh, 
yeah i think i have a few queries on discord already where people are asking whether chat is not available and unfortunately yeah it is not available because there are a lot of people who are not customers they are also joining so i'm planning to keep it as uh, disciplined as possible in the chats that's the reason so to get started uh, this is uh, the core of brutal whenever you uh, start brutal for the first time you will find it's driven by a json api server Operators can use the API documentation to automate various tasks in JSON, and it can easily handle 500 plus connections in as less as four gigabytes of RAM. The binary is compiled in x64. Uh, the server supports ARM as well as AMD64. The user interface is called as Commander, which currently supports Windows 10, 11, Linux, x64, especially Ubuntu, and ARM Apple Silicon as well. Uh, it adopts a responsive design approach for uh, information seeking and na navigation. It also provides you support for high DPI, and you can write custom themes uh, for the user interface in CSS, uh, which can be changed dynamically on the fly as well. Uh, you can, in fact, request uh, chat GPT as well to build uh, themes for you. This is something that I have done, and it does uh, generate these themes pretty flawlessly for brute detail. So uh, before I go into the further part, let me quickly start the server over here and uh, explain how this works. So when you download Brutal for the first time, this is how the package would be. If I execute the uh, Linux package over here, you will see we have one single option called as hyphen Rotel. I will execute that, and you will see a variety of different options over here, which can be used to start the command and control server. So now we can either use this or we can use a profile to start the command and control. I'll use both of them and I'll show you the difference between uh, how you can automate a variety of tasks so that you don't have to repeat the same things over and over again. So over here, I'll specify hyphen A, admin, hyphen P, password, SC for my certificate. Currently, I'm using a self-signed certificate over here. P hyphen uh, H is going to be where my handler will start. So I'll start 0000, 000 over here. And uh, yeah, I think that should be fine. And you can see it has automatically generated a random key, which will be used to encrypt your post uh, request and response that will be embedded within your malleable profile within HTTP, TCP, SMB, DOH, or any other request that you might use. Now, once this is started, I will also execute my commander interface. Currently, I'm using Ubuntu 20.04. And this is how the user interface would currently look like. Now it's pretty much empty, and all the texts that you would see on the screen are totally scrollable and zoomable over here. You can add a new HTTP listener by going to C4 Profiler and selecting HTTP listener. Over here, you can add your own custom malleable profiles, which can be appended and prepended to your post request. Similarly, you can also add your own custom headers over here if required, which includes your fronting headers or anything else. Uh, a quick documentation on how uh, each of these fields should look like. And you can also add an empty response over here that the server should return back in case there is nothing to respond to, to the uh, payloads or badges that we call them over here. So whenever your uh, payload or badges call back to the command and control center, they will send a set of uh, data for whatever commands you have asked it to execute. Now, when this data is sent back, whatever prepend and append data that you add over here will be added to your uh, malleable uh, data that gets sent by your brute retails payload. However, there could be scenarios where you have not executed something on uh, the badger and the badger still needs to send some data. So instead of sending some uh, empty data over here, the badger will just send you the authentication information and the server will just send in whatever response that you want over here. So you can add uh, JavaScript, HTML, or anything else uh, that you might want to add to make it look like a legitimate request. Now, this is pretty important over here. The reason for that is because uh, badger encrypts and encodes the data to base64 or hex. It's totally random every time. And it sends that to the command and control center, which is embedded within the malleable profile. If you don't add your malleable data over here, there's a high chance that your payload might be flagged by the antivirus on the network itself because it will contain a high number of entropy. That is why it is very important to add your custom malleable profiles over here in this case. Over here, you can specify your listener name. I'll just name it as, let's say, primary-c2. 
the listener bind host which you want to bind to i'll currently select this one which is my uh, vmware ip address and i'll select the rotation host as same however if you have multiple uh, domains over here for example your multiple redirectors you can add them over here in a comma separated value in this case i'll select same since this is my current local system over here itself the port, the user agent, the URIs that you might want to add where the payload will connect back. Let's say I'll type it over here as content.php, admin, comma, bootstrap, or whatever you require. OS is currently limited to Windows. Uh, the SSL, whether you want to enable it or not, on the for the uh, payload, I'll keep it as yes. Any proxy that you might want to configure over here, the sleep masking mechanisms, I will explain each of these as we proceed. Any module to stomp, again, something which I will explain in detail when we go into the module stomping part today later on, and the default sleep and jitter mechanisms. I'll keep this to one and zero so that it connects back to me pretty fast. Fallback profile is currently set to one because we don't have any profiles as it's a new server. So whenever your uh, payload connects back, if it is unable to reach the server, it will use this profile, which you can add it separately over here or as a listener over here as well. So that uh, if your primary command and control communication does not work, it will fall back to this option over here. Then we have common auth, one-time auth, and uh, uh, create random set of authentication keys option over here. Now, the scenario over here is that uh, if you're doing a phishing activity, you don't want the same uh, payload to be executed more than once. In such scenarios, you will see use a one-time auth so that when the payload communicates to the server, it sends back a uh, password and this password is used by your server to authenticate to the command and control framework once that authentication is complete over here the server returns back with a token and that token is used to communicate back and forth with the server now when the payload is killed the server sends the authentication key again but since it's a one-time authentication key the server would have deleted that from the server and it won't have that key again to authenticate and it will straight away deny the request something that can be pretty useful when you're doing phishing activities the next part that we have is the common auth, which is something is what we will be using. You can either select to create a random key over here, or you can just type one over here like this, for example. And whether you want the C2 to automatically die, sorry, whether you want the payload to automatically die if it is unable to reach the command and control server. So hoping that I have filled everything, I'll just select save. And you can see my command and control over here has started. We can view the server configuration over here by just clicking on this icon here. This is how your server profile would look like. The whole payload configuration, uh, the SMB configurations are empty and nothing much over here, just pretty uh, basic set of fancy operations. Uh, so what we'll do right now is we can create a stageless payload over here. Uh, you can see we have default, stealth, um, and x86 um, payloads over here that we can create. Make note that this service executable is not your general executable, so you cannot just create a service executable and execute it. It should be executed by service main or your, uh, by your service control manager within Windows, else it will not work, which is the uh, where the service main is the entry point, unlike your int main or something similar. You have your DLL, which can be executed via run DL32, and the entry point is main over here. Or you can generate shell code, which is what I usually do in my red team engagements. The most obsec one over here is the stealth one with RTL exit user thread, which performs a lot of unhooking and stuff, uh, both for ETW as well as your uh, user land hooks, which I'll discuss a, uh, a little bit later on when we come to the badges part over here. So now this is how we can start your listener. Uh, make note that if you go to your profile section, so profiles are uh, ways in Brutotel as to how you can add your own custom profiles and uh, change your payload information to connect back to the command and control. For example, let's say over here, now I started the server on one of my uh, command and control on either DigitalOcean or AWS, for example. I don't want to expose this directly to my payload. I want the payload to connect to, uh, let's say, some uh, fronted domain or let's say, a redirector from uh, CloudFront or Azure Edge in this case. So what I'll do is currently my server configuration, if you see, this is where my configuration is. So what I'll do is I'll go to profiles, payload profiles. I click on this uh, payload configuration and click on edit profile. I'll change the name over here as let's say, for example, primary C2 hyphen, let's say C1. That's my custom one payload profile. 
Over here, I can specify the rotational host, for example, xyz.azurex.net. Want to provide over here as many as you want. Port over here, configurations, and whatever they require. Currently, I'll just specify something like, let's say, xyz.azurex.net, for example. You can provide multiple uh, separated by commas over here and any other information that you require. And finally, save. Now we can see that it is saved separately apart from your primary profile, which is connected to your listener. You can use this profile to generate a payload. So now what will happen is that when the implant is executed, it will try to connect to this uh, host that you have provided. And that host will basically do the task of your redirection and forwarding it to your primary listener. So you can have as many different profiles as you require along with malleable profiles and stuff. And you don't have to worry about starting multiple listeners, just multiple different rotational hosts or your uh, different uh, redirectors over here only. Now, once this has been created, you can again click on this uh, icon over here. And you can see that we should have the payload configuration over here as well. Primary hyphen C2 hyphen C1 and other metadata for my profile. Now, let me kill this and show you how you can automate this whole task. I'll close this uh, user interface. And over here as well, I'll, click, I'll type control C. And you can see that if I do a cat on autosave.profile, my profile is already saved over here on this with the payload information and stuff. So now what I can do is I can either start my command and control with the hyphen R option. You can see over here that it has automatically detected that it contains a autosave.profile. I can either restore that and you can see that my listeners and everything have been restored. Or what I can do is I can directly specify my custom profile which I should have in the basic profile JSON file. And you can see this is my custom profile which I will be using right now. So the name is primary C2. The, I have added my own custom uh, credentials, which I can use later on for uh, building tokens and moving laterally. My com encryption key is something custom that I provided. The append, append response. You have the res custom response headers, the prepend, prepend response. All of these are your malleable profile data, the request headers. The payload configuration, which I provided for SMB and TCB payload as well. And all these profiles are by default present as sample in your BRC4 package when you download it from the uh, website itself. The C2 auth, make note that a lot of people confuse this C2 authentication key uh, and they just type in something totally random, but that will not work. It should be similar to that of your uh, listeners uh, authentication key over here. One of the listeners authentication key that you might provide here. If you don't, then your payload won't be able to authenticate either via pivot or directly to the command and control center. And finally, the SSL key path over here itself. What I'll do is I'll specify uh, hyphen uh, C profiles, basic profile. And you can see that it's asking me to use the hyphen F option since the uh, autosave.profile is already existing in the current directory. So if I specify hyphen F, it will override the saved profile that I have. I can start my uh, user interface and you can see that my profile is already loaded over here for listeners and you can see the whole configuration. So now the next thing that I'm going to do is to create a payload over here by right clicking. Uh, stageless, I'll create a default payload for this point of time. I'll save it to my documents directory. And you can see that it was a bin payload, which is my shell code. So let me go back over here and uh yeah let me check exit this in my documents directory you will see that i have a payload profile a payload over here my shell code is of around 247 kilobytes we will come to this part later on over here because we'll be generating some more uh different um uh, variations over here and I'll explain how this whole thing works. So coming back to uh, the Brutal score, the core shell code is uh, basically your position independent shell code, which is written in a mixture of C and assembly. It supports everything from Windows Vista to Windows 11, and it contains built-in anti-debug tricks uh, as well as uh, debug tricks to uh, hunt down your various EDR hooks which are placed uh, such as your vectored exception handlers, DLL load notification hooks, or your user land hooks, PEB hooks, uh, hooks that override your uh, syscall values to perform syscall tracing in this case, EW, and a lot more. 
So all of these are come pre-built within Brutotel so that you don't have to make any such changes over here. And uh, it contains various anti-debugging tricks as well. So if you directly load your Brutotel shell code into, uh, let's say, for example, uh, a debugger, it won't directly run. It will detect the anti-debugging. Um, it will use the anti-debugging techniques to hunt down various um, uh, debuggers and modify how uh, the control flow of the executable goes or the shell code goes. Now, one of the most important things or uh, where people get confused a lot is the execution of the shell code. Now, the execution of Brutal shell code is a little bit different uh, from that of Cobalt Strike. And there is a very important reason why. Uh, your Cobalt Strike shell code, so most of the C2s that you uh, see or use from uh, the open source ones or the paid ones, uh, all of these shell code wrappers contain a uh, reflective DLL. The shell code wrappers will directly extract the DLL and execute that into memory. It's a little bit different in case of Brutotel. In case of Brutotel, uh, the shell code wrapper does exist, but it does not extract a reflective DLL. It extracts a P, which uh, cannot be executed without the shell code wrapper. I'll explain this when we come to the uh, shell code wrapping part and the YAR rule part, which we have uh, later on today over here. But yeah, that's how the Cobalt Strike and the Brutotel's uh, shell code differ. And I'll explain how uh, what things need to be changed in order to successfully execute the uh, Brutotel's payload over here. We can use encryption with randomly, uh, Brutotel by default uses encryption with randomly generated keys. And it stores uh, the C2 configuration in an encrypted format within the Badger score. And it uses custom encryption algorithm to hide its uh, traffic within the network data, such as your TCP, DOH, SMB, and more. And it also uses authenticated stage uh, for authenticated. Uh, uh, it, sorry, it also uses authentication for both staged and stageless payloads. As we've seen uh, just a few minutes back, where I was entering my credentials, such as ABCD at one two three, over there. So now let me go to the next slide deck. So uh, for those of you who are uh, who have switched to Brutal from Metasploit or uh, Cobalt Strike you would have noticed that there is no option to generate an executable within Brutotel. And there is a very logical reason for that. When you generate um, executables, like raw executables, the YAR rules are can be easily generated for these opcodes, and detections can be built much, much easier. And a lot of people will simply build the EXEs, drop them on disk, and making the payload much, much more obvious to EDRs. So in case of Brutotel, I decided to provide only shell code. So now for those of you who don't have experience with shell code, it is just raw opcodes or your uh, machine codes, which can be executed directly via the CPU itself. It's a position independent shell code that is being generated by Brutotel. It prevents any use of static libraries, which means you won't have any import tables again in case of your Badger to hook to, similar to your Cobalt Strike, where you can actually hook to the IAT. That cannot be done with Brutotel because there aren't any import address tables at all. There are no export address tables at all in the uh, extracted core. And all the data is purely encrypted. And the encryption key changes for every payload that you build. So if you generate a payload right now, and if you generate a payload two minutes later from the server, the total MD5 SHA sum will be purely different because the key for the encryption is different, which gets embedded within the payload itself. And uh, yeah, let me go back to the slide decks. And shellcode loaders. So this is a very common technique to execute your shellcodes. Obviously, I would. This is again just for uh, a demo purpose. I would not uh, suggest to use this exact same technique in your engagements. Just give me a minute while I get some water. Okay. So your shellcodes are uh, independent in nature, which means they can be executed via any programming language. And they can be executed from anywhere uh, within an executable region, and they don't necessarily have to be aligned, especially with Brutotel, because it automatically aligns its shell code into memory. That's why it's called as a position independent shell code. Now, the most common technique to execute any shell code is to convert the bin file that we have into an unsigned car array. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be taking an example of a C program over here that we will be writing right now. Once you've converted into unsigned car array, just copy the shell code. Uh, so you can. So most likely you should usually encrypt it with ZOR or something else. 
I would recommend something like RC4 because it has less entropy as compared to your, uh, I would say, um, AES 128 or 256. And the same time, you can also it will also have less size of data as well. And at the same time, you can copy the shell code to a re uh, writable region, change the permissions from RW to RX, and execute it as a thread function or a pointer callback, whatever you would uh, wish to execute it as. Over here, let me give you an example as to how it can be done. So this is a very small example. I'll share all of these materials once the seminar is complete. These are also present online. If you go to the GitHub repository, you will find uh, these samples into the uh, shell code loader samples over here. What I'm executing here is something as simple as allocating memory for read write, copying my shell code value, which is inside this unsigned car array, to my uh, pointer over here, which was provided to me by virtual alloc API call, change the permission to page execute read, create a thread on this address pointer. And this is where uh, there's a very small difference. If you're using Cobalt Strike or Metasploit, you would usually have something called as a handle over here, which you will uh, take from your create thread API call and will wait on that handle. But the way Brute Rail shellcode works is that this handle that you would get, you cannot wait on that handle because the thread that you are creating, this is a temporary thread. Reason being that whenever you execute shellcode, me as a developer of Brutal, I do not know how OPSEC safe would the operator execute the shellcode as. So what I have done in case of Brutal is that the moment you execute this thread, this uh, thread that you are creating, it will automatically align some stacks, unhook the EDRs region, and uh, perform a lot of evasions at the very start before executing the Brutal score. And it will create a new thread for the Brutal score to be executed with a valid stack pointer as well as with a valid uh, thread start address, and then it will exit. So, which means that the sh thread that you are creating, it will hardly be active for one or two seconds, after which that thread will exit and the main thread of Brute Total will continue to execute in a separate thread. Which means that if you try to wait on the handle of this thread, you will not be able to wait and it will simply return over here, which is something that we don't want because that means that the process will directly exit. So that is why we wait on handle minus one, which means which is basically a pseudo ID for your get current process API call itself. So let's see how uh, this this will actually work in a real uh, time scenario. So uh, for uh, demo purpose, I have automated this into a very small shell script called as bin compiler dot asset. It simply takes a few arguments, x86 or x64, the shell code bin file, and an output executable name that we can provide. So over here, if we have provided it with the proper arguments, it will take this bin file, rename it to shellcode.bin, uh, use xxd or hexdum to convert this bin file to a uh, unsigned car array into a header file. Once it has converted this into an unsigned car array into an header file, it will simply use uh, check if it is x86 or x64. Depending upon that, it will select the compiler and convert this C file that I have, which I'll explain in a second, and convert this C file into a executable by statically linking it to NTDLL. You can also skip this part as well, not really important. And if I take a look at my shell code over here, my shell code loader, it's a pretty small file. It simply creates a notepad.exe process, allocates some memory uh, into that process, uh, writes uh, the uh, shell code to that process over here, prints the PID and the address pointer, uh, changes the permission to execute read and calls create remote thread. Again, this is not really OPSEC safe. I'm just doing it to show you how uh, the uh, memory artifacts would look like for Brutal's Badger. You would eventually have to find a valid way which does evade uh, the initial execution. For example, maybe executed as a function pointer or uh, maybe executed via some uh, callback mechanism. Uh, a lot of these samples are present into the GitHub repository link that I will be sharing through this uh, slide deck for you later on. So now what I'll do is I'll just type bash then compiler.sh. I have an 64-bit uh, shell code that I have created over here. And I'll specify badger.exe. That's all I need to do. And let me bring my uh, Windows system over here. And if I refresh it, you can see I have badger.exe over here. Now, uh, as per our shellcode, it should execute a notepad.exe. I'm not hiding the window of notepad just for demo purpose. 
and it should directly print it out us over here as well. So as you can see, our notepad.exe was created. You can see we have a prompt over here. And if I go back to my command and control, you can see we have a new connection over here from notepad.exe itself. It's pretty much empty, nothing fancy that we have done. Now let's see how uh, this will uh, look like in terms of evasion. I'll put it to, let's say, sleep five. You can just type help space sleep to see uh, the uh, configuration of the specific command. I've just set it to static five seconds at this point. So going back uh, to the slide decks. So Brutal will by default use uh, thread stack spoofing and sleep masking to avoid the initial detections. And uh, it will uh, basically use all these techniques to execute the initial core of Brutal itself. Now, the reason why this is important over here is because of this. This is how Brutal shellcode would look like. I'll show it to you in a second. So if I go back over here and if I open this, you can see that all its threads are pretty legitimate. If I go to uh, the user interface, you can see my thread ID is 3092. I can go to 3092 over here. And if I open this up, you can see it has a valid stack. You can also see the entry point over here is NTDLL exclamation TP release cleanup group members. Again, this entry point can also be modified within Badger by going over here and specifying, let's say help uh, set uh, start address. And you can modify the start address of the Badger over here as well in this case. So over here, I have just kept it to default, which is uh, the actual value of uh, TP release cleanup group members over here. However, and you can also see the stack is clean. When I say the stack is clean, it means it has a valid stack frame. It starts from uh, a valid location on disk, that is NT, uh, the RTL user thread start from ntdll.dll, then the base thread init thumb, and then it can have any other valid stack frame that you might want. Similarly, if you take a look at any other values over here, for example, this or this, for example, so these will have valid stack frames over here. And this is what uh, how it is different from that of Cobalt Strike. If you execute Cobalt Strike, you will see that the thread start address is basically going to be 0x0, which means it has not spoofed the entry point. And you can also see that the stack frame is also not valid. So when you're dealing with EDR, such as 40 EDR or MDATP or Elastic, which tend to enumerate the call stack with the help of EDW calls in the kernel, this can be pretty easily detectable over here. Now, with Cobalt Strike, I think you would have to use the uh, sleep masking kit and you would have to write the whole initial loader to make it and uh, hook the IIT and stuff and perform a lot of operations to make it evadable. In case of Brutotail, you don't really have to do anything. Just write a quick loader, execute your shell code, and that's all you need to do. Now, uh, if you want to um, understand more on how these detections take place from the Blue Team perspective, you can uh, take a look at both of these blogs, which are really great. And Elastic has done some really good uh, job on building detections, uh, especially in memory and not just static Yara rules like a lot of EDRs that are currently there. Malleable profiles, I've already explained how malleable profiles work. In my current example over here, if you take a look at the listeners, you can see the malleable profile that I have. I expand this. You can see that I have added uh, this malleable profile over here. If I click on this plus icon, you will see this is my malleable profile. Curly braces, double quotes, channel, double quotes, colon, uh, double quotes over here. This is for my post request that the payload will send. And this is how the response will be sent back my, by my server. And this is an empty response which will be sent back by my server if there is nothing to respond to. And a few request headers over here which I have added, just random ones for demo purpose. So this is how the data actually goes. So you can see over here that my actual badges data which is encrypted and encoded it will go over here in the network inside the malleable data that you have added. Uh, so currently, I have added a very simple one. In a real life scenario, make sure that you add a very decent or a big malleable data to make it look legitimate to your Azure Edge or your, uh, uh, let's say, your Amazon or anything else that you are currently using as your fronted redirector in this case. Now, coming back to uh, Yara rules. So there are two types of core Yara rules. Uh, the primary one is string-based, and the secondary one is uh, hex-based or opcode-based detections. 
Uh, I wrote a quick YAR rule for Brutal 1.2.x, uh, which was leaked uh, last year. So let me see if I can pull the uh, uh, one second. Let me just uh, pull this over here. OK. So this is the YAR rule which I wrote for Brutal last year. So you can see that it has a variety of strings present within Brutal. Now, uh, over here, uh, a lot of these strings would be unique to Brute Retail and not to anyone else. So if any EDR tries to search for these strings in the memory of Brute Retail, they will be able to quickly identify BRC4. But make note that this is only for till version V1.2.9, after which all these strings were released. But however, even if you're able to avoid this, there will still be opcodes within your shell code, which can be used to build detections. For example, the previous versions of Brute Retail, uh, the opcodes of the shell code started with these values that you see over here. And uh, I have added a few conditions over here on how to check with specific opcode uh, values over here to uh, detect Brute Retail. However, none of this will be valid for the V1.7 uh, version or anything after V1.2.9. Because in case of Brute Retail, the Yara rules keep on changing with every major release. So let me explain how these Yara rules uh, tend to work. So when we are talking about Brute Retail, uh, think of this as your whole entire payload that you see, this whole uh, Badger value. Now over here, inside Badger, you have the initial shellcode loader of Brute Retail, and you have an encrypted blob, which contains a C2 configuration and the payload score. Now what this loader does over here is that Brute Retail, uh, does not provide any support for the Yara rules that are provided for the loader here. Because this can be simply encrypted with ZOR or custom shellcode loaders, and you will be able to evade this Yara rule. Make note that this is also the same Yara detection that you will see the moment you create um, a shellcode, put it inside a blob file and try to execute it without encrypting it, your EDR might flag it that it is Brute Retail or something similar, because we are not planning to evade this Yara rule. And I'll also tell why. Because this can simply be evaded because it's a static Yara rule and not a dynamic one. This can simply be evaded by zoring it out over here. Because what this loader does at all is that it will simply decrypt this with a custom decryption algorithm present within Brute Retail. It will extract the uh, decrypted C2 configuration and the core and execute the core over here as a function pointer in a different thread. Now, this is where the main detections come into picture. As soon as this core is executed, the core will erase this portion of the shellcode loader from memory, which means that even if a threat hunter finds this portion of code into memory, which is again unlikely, but if provided that they find it, and if they dump it to disk, they will still not be able to load this with a custom um, uh, reflective loader like you could do for Cobalt Strike or Metasploit, because this whole loader is totally uh, dependent on the Brute shell shellcode loader, and none of the other loaders will work over here. Now, let's say, for example, what a threat hunter might do in this case is that uh, even it is not encrypted, when it is decrypted, your payload might be running some tasks. For example, let's say you start SOX proxy on your endpoint, on your uh, seat, on your uh, host. In this case, the payload will not sleep when the SOX proxy is running because it needs to continuously listen for TCP data or your UDP data, and it needs to send back to the command and control center. Now, what happens over here is that if you perform any post exploitation activity, which might be suspicious to an EDR. Now, the EDR might be suspicious, and it will try to trace the call stack. When it, it tries to take the trace the call stack, it will eventually come back to your original core, and then it will search for a known set of Yara rules that is specifically going to detect your core over here in this case. That is basically going to be in your Rx or the X region that you allocated. And this is where this detection comes into picture. So most of the time, you will be able to evade this specific code detection around 99% of the time. But if you are if you are getting detected at this specific part when the code is executed, then you can surely uh, let me know over Discord or somewhere else. And even in every major release, this Yara rule will be updated. For example, in the last release, this detection over here was made by uh, Elastic on the reflective loader for uh, executing um, executables into memory for the memexec command. So Elastic built a detection on that which uh, was modified into the v1.6 and 1.7 release and no longer elastic detects this specific core into memory this is where the r rule support is provided for brute retail and not this part because this part can be simply evaded by using zor or any other custom encoding or encryption algorithm 
However, this is something that not a user can modify, and that is why Blue Turtle provides you support to uh, modify uh, the uh, uh, values over here. And I continuously keep on testing it against various EDRs, make changes to the core of the Blue Turtle, and provide it to you so that you, as an operator, doesn't have to modify these values over here. So, yeah, that was a long rant. So, let me just get some water again. Okay. Um, any questions still here? Uh, let me check uh, the Discord a bit. Okay. No questions still now. So uh, let's uh, proceed. If you have any questions, for those of you who joined late, you can directly post it up into the workshops channel itself. Okay. So let's go on to the uh, next part. DLL side loading. So now this is not something specific to Brute Retail. However, I have taken this part because a lot of people, uh, what I've seen a lot of operators tend to do is uh, they'll simply take uh, the first shellcode loader they will find on GitHub. They'll put Brute Retail shellcode inside that and they will execute it. Now, that's bad in terms of OPSEC in every other way. First of all, you are executing an unsigned executable which does not have any properties or metadata present in it. And secondly, the loaders that are present on GitHub will be flagged by almost every other EDR or antiviruses that are there. We don't want that to happen. So in such scenarios, the best way is to use a DLL side load or something similar that you might want to use or DLL hijacks or something else. So I'll be explaining how DLL side loads tend to work and I'll be giving an example of a very um, uh, common executable. I'm not sure how many of you know, but there's something that I posted in one of my Elastic Evasion videos last year. That is WFS.exe. So let me explain how this works and what are the different issues that you might face, which I have seen like almost every operator faces when they deal with DLL side loads. So the way DLL side load works is that whenever you execute an executable, uh, let me take an example over here. Let's say uh, I'll open CFF Explorer file open and uh, let's say I will open WFS.exe itself. So you can see the P headers for your WFS over here. And if you scroll down, you will see the IAT, which is your import address table. And you can see all the DLLs that are being imported. If you click on each of these DLLs, you will see various API calls that are being called for each of these DLLs over here in this scenario. Now you can see over here that these are the static DLLs and not the ones that are dynamically loaded. Static DLLs are those whose address path or the path on disk is something that you cannot modify. It will always be into your C Windows System 32 directory itself. So we need to find uh, DLLs which are dynamically loaded by the executables. And that can only be done with the help of a debugger or something similar. So I tend to use a debugger x64 dbg, but if you're a fan of something else, then you can surely go ahead and use that. So I'll go to uh, file, open, shared folders, documents, seminar, WFS, and I will open this executable. So you can see over here that it has reached the entry point or the breakpoint, the initial entry point of my WFS.exe. Everything that was loaded till here before the entry point got hit all of these are going to be your statically loaded DLLs from within your IAT itself. Now, we are not going to, uh, now we know that we cannot modify the path for these statically loaded DLLs uh, as they are hard coded. So we will be skipping this altogether and I'll perform, I'll right click and select on clear over here. I'll let it continue and you can see that more set of DLLs are loaded. Now, after the entry point is hit, everything that gets loaded, uh, that gets loaded are loaded by your load library API call by the developer who wrote that software or who wrote that DLL. So these DLLs are your dynamically loaded DLLs over here. And any of these DLLs, we can test and see if they are basically uh, 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 being called when the process is getting executed to see if any API call is getting executed because DLL main of every other DLL will by default be called. But we are not interested in DLL main because executing anything in DLL main is a very bad idea. And that's not me saying that. It's basically defined by Microsoft itself if you go to their uh, documentation over here. Now, I'm not going to explain this whole documentation over uh, here, but if you just search for, let's say, for example, 
Okay, so I think uh, the recording stopped for some reason uh, and uh, it got disconnected. So let me share the screen again. Can you guys tell me where uh, did the connection get dropped? Ah, okay, so the call dropped a while ago. Okay, let me explain this uh, all over again. Give me a second. Yes, uh, sure. I'll explain this again. Uh, it's again set to recording and my bad. The connection thing is, let me explain this whole thing again. So over here, uh, I had this executable over here. And in this executable, I'll simply go and start WFS. So right now, if you take a look at this executable, and if you take a look at the import address table of this WFS.exe, which I have opened in CFF Explorer, you can see there are various uh, DLLs that are being loaded. These are all your static DLLs that are being loaded. These are not dynamically loaded DLLs. Static DLLs uh, are being loaded with a proper path from C, Windows System 32, or other respective paths, which you should be able to see over here in this case. You can see the full path and everything. In case of a DLL side load, the exe, when it tries to call load library, the load library first checks in the current directory, then the subsequent directories as per the Windows search order. So in this case, what we are simply trying to do here is that we are trying to find any DLLs that are being loaded dynamically. And then we will try to see if there are any export functions from these DLLs that get called. So over here, you can see that my entry point, as soon as I started WFS.exe, my entry breakpoint that is going to be uh, my main CRT startup runtime of my uh, executable being called. And every other DLL that you see over here is basically a statically loaded DLL. So I cannot hijack any of these DLLs because they are loaded from a proper Windows path. So I'll clear it. I let it run. And now you can see various other DLLs after the entry point is called is being loaded, which means over here that all these DLLs that you see, all these DLLs are your dynamically loadable directories. So dynamically loadable uh, DLLs in this case. So over here, I have to uh, test every other DLL that is being loaded and see if any of these uh, DLLs export functions are being called. So I can go to the symbol section and I can just add a, a pointer, basically a breakpoint on every uh, function that is currently present here. In my case, I can take an example of scan setting.dll itself because scan setting.dll contains, okay, so let me actually uh, pause this because currently uh, this is my compiled executable, which I just compiled. I'll just do make clean and I will run it again. Okay, I'll clear the logs. Now, all these are my dynamically loadable uh, DLLs. If I go to symbols, you will see various other DLLs that have been loaded. Now, if I want to see if any of the export functions are being called, I can simply take a DLL and add a breakpoint on all its export functions and let it run. So if any of the export function is call being called by the executable, I can basically take that executable itself, uh, sorry, the DLL itself and craft a similar DLL. For example, in case of scan setting, I can add breakpoints to all these four functions. Make note that I'm not adding uh, a breakpoint on DLL main. I'm only adding a make point uh, breakpoints over here on everything apart from DLL main and DLL can unload now over here in this case. And the reason for that is because I want to see if any of these API calls are hit. If they are, I will craft my own custom scan setting dot DLL and create my own custom function, whichever gets hit. And next time when I execute WFS.exe, I'll drop this scan setting.dll in the same directory. So WFS.exe will load scan setting, which will execute one of my API calls, which will execute my shell code. Now, the reason why I am not using DLL main over here is because Microsoft itself specifies over here that calling DLL main is bad because it leads to a loader lock. Now, threads in DLL main can hold loader locks, so no additional DLLs can be dynamically loaded or initialized. What that means over here is that, let me go to my slide deck. Over here, we can see that my uh, the moment you execute your signed executable, which is WFS.exe in our case, it calls load library to load a specific DLL. Let's uh, say our uh, DLL is scan setting.dll. 
and before it does uh, it calls loader lock so that it does not fall into a race condition now this loader lock can perform a variety of things but uh, to keep it short this loader lock is basically an api call called as enter critical section and whenever there is a specific uh, portion of the code which is under loader lock nothing apart from that specific piece of code can be executed which means is that whenever you call loader lock and call dll main and if you have your shell code inside dll main the shell code itself might need to load some additional libraries for example winhinet.dll winhttp.dll or your ws2_3.dll all these are dlls which require you to connect to the internet or any other dlls as well now when you load the other dependencies of your shell code the other dlls required by your shell code these dlls again will call a loader lock because they might need to load other dlls as well now when it tries to acquire the loader lock there is already a loader lock happening over here so this loader lock will wait for the previous lock to release and the previous lock is waiting for the new lock to release so that the dll main exits at the moment dll main is exiting it will basically unlock your loader lock which means your loader lock is waiting for this loader lock to uh, resume whereas this loader lock is waiting for this to resume which ends up creating a deadlock so nothing will get executed and you will forever be waiting over here now this is the primary thing which is bad secondary reason why this is bad is because even if you are able to let's say bypass this race condition somehow every time there is a thread attach thread detach uh, process attach process detach or any other event that is happening which the windows loader needs to notify other dlls of then in that case the dll main will be called again and again that is why you might remember when this whole side loader thing started around 2 years back a lot of people were complaining that whenever you execute microsoft teams it ends up giving you 6 7 8 different uh, types of shell code or callbacks over and over again that is because the dll main gets called whenever thread attach or thread detach events and a variety of other events usually happen and there are a lot of undocumented code by microsoft because of undocumented reasons because of which the dll main can also be called over and over again and that is why it's always and always a bad thing to execute literally anything inside dll main and that is why what we are doing is we are not touching dll main we are going to uh, use our exported function which gets hit and if i let uh, if i kill this and if i run this after adding my breakpoint so let me remove all these breakpoints that i have here i click remove all okay For some reason, it's not removing all. Let me just select them and remove them manually. And I'll let the so this is my legitimate executable. What I'll do is I'll go to symbols, search for scan setting, and I'll add a breakpoint on all these uh, export functions. I'll stop it, clear the screen, start it again, and let it run. and you can see that my uh, that i have my scan setting dot prod dlg take fg if this whole thing is being hit right now if i drag this up you can see my breakpoint has been hit which you can also see over here in the logs which means if i craft a similar dll create a similar function drop that inside wfs.exe it will give me a connection back it will basically execute this scan setting dot dll and this function over here I have my uh, C code over here. It's a very small piece of code, as you can see. It takes a bin file, converts the bin file to a custom name, extracts the shell code uh, into an unsigned car array, uses use minwgcc to convert this C file that I have into a scan setting dot dll as a dll. And in the C file over here, the small file, my dll main is empty. It doesn't do anything. My <clears throat> export function over here returns long api long uh, as a value and it simply prints message box whether it was successful in executing this uh, function it allocates some memory executes uh, copies the shell code over there and executes it by after converting it into a page execute read region you can also see that i am typecasting it into a pointer of a function which is a function pointer and executing the function pointer and waiting for on the current process handler so that it does not go ahead from here altogether So this is what we'll be doing. I'll just type make uh, build 
ah my bad i have to uh, drop the shell code here so i'll uh, go back right click stageless and i'll drop that into my uh, compilation directory over here itself i'll exit i'll exit my previous uh, notepad.exe as i don't need it anymore i'll remove it i'll do make build and you can see it has converted uh, it has renamed my file over here extracted the shell code into an unsigned car array execute converted that to a scan setting.dll now let's go back and uh, to our seminar wfs and we have a scan setting this is our custom scan setting.dll if i execute this you can see we get a prompt that our shell code was executed I will go back to my user interface and you can see we have a connection from wfs.exe itself. If I type, let's say, and you can also see that this is our thread ID that is 8804. If I go back to our, uh, let's say, WFS, you can see 8804 is our shell code with a valid call stack, valid entry point, and everything over here itself. So, is this clear? Any doubts on this? How, why, how? DLL side loading can help you to evade AVs because it is basically backed by legitimate values on disk and uh, it is also being executed by legitimate executable. At the same time, do not execute anything inside DLL main. Uh, do not uh, use, so current example, I've used wfs.exe. Some ADRs do tend to check the values that are present over here. The moment they see it is uh, the file description is my, uh, Microsoft Windows, anything related to Microsoft, they will see if this DLL is, sorry, this executable is a part of C Windows System 32. If it is, and if your executable is being executed from any other region apart from C Windows System 32, it will flag that as malicious. That is why I would not recommend using built-in executables. I do know that you can still get away with some EDRs which do not uh, perform this uh, uh, matching part of C Windows System 32 and the part from where you are executing your executable. But some EDRs like CrowdStrike or Elastic will tend to catch it. In such scenarios, what I would recommend is uh, not using this built-in Microsoft binaries. They're like a shit ton of other libraries that you can use or executables that you can use, for example, like your um, Citrix workspace or your uh, Cisco Collab host. And there are like tons and tons of other executables which you can use, which do not belong to Microsoft, which do not reside under C Windows System 32. And that can really help you to get away against various other ideas that you would have. OK, so going back, that's the whole thing with your uh, deal side load. Let me see if my connection is still there and it's not dropped out. OK, perfect. So over here, uh, uh, going on to the next part, uh, module stomping. So module stomping is a pretty important part of brute retail. And if you're dealing with 40 EDR or elastic EDR, this is something you might want to keep an eye out for. Because eventually, even though if you have a valid call stack, when you perform push exploitation activities, some activities might not have a valid call stack and you will want them to be backed by a valid DLL. If it's not, Elastic will Elastic and 40 EDR will clearly flag it, tagging it as malicious. Brutal uses an advanced technique of module stomping, which loads the Windows DLL into memory using load library X API call. It overwrites the DLL's .tex section with its shell code, executes the shell code, and the shell code runs with a clean call stack. However, there's more to it than that because if you're, if you have used Cobalt Strike, right, you would have used uh, uh, module stomping in Cobalt Strike. But when you use module stomping in Cobalt Strike, uh, the uh, the API call that is used to load a DLL uh, from disk into memory, you have to make sure that that DLL's entry point is not called. Because the moment you call its entry point, various threads will start from that DLL, and you will not be able to override uh, overwrite its .txt section with your own shell code. That is why um, operators use the load library X API call to load that file as um, a data file as an exe instead of a DLL into memory. But the issue over here is that the moment you load an uh, 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 any DLL as 
let's say um, with load library X API call, you will end up. Uh, let me see. Uh, someone has a question. Every application EXE does have a part of system 32 after installation. So an EDR can whitelist. Uh, not really. Uh, the EDS can whitelist only selected non Microsoft EXEs, not all of them, because they're like tons and tons of paths and an EDR cannot start scraping the internet for all its valid softwares and start whitelisting them. So it becomes very hard for EDRs and I haven't seen any EDR do that. They only basically search for Microsoft DLS itself, nothing else. Coming back over here. Uh, so when you load any DLL using load library X API call, that DLL gets loaded as a data file or as a e exe image instead of a DLL image, which means since it's DLL uh, main should not be called, load library X will simply load it into the PEB and modify its PEB regions such as this. So you can see on the left hand side that the entry point is set to null so that the DLL main is not called. The flags are changed. The, uh, the DLL is not loaded as a DLL. In fact, it is loaded as a uh, in fact, the value over here is false, which means that this DLL was loaded as a EXE. Load notifications were not sent. The static import was not processed and a lot of other things. You can use these commands. Uh, and if you're using Cobalt Strike, you can simply see how the modern stomping in Cobalt Strike would look like. So this is very suspicious. And any threat hunter with a decent knowledge of the process environment block within a process with access to WinDBG can take a look at this. In case of Brutal, Brutal patches this entry point and patches it to the valid entry point of the EX of the DLL itself. It will also modify the flags to make it look legitimate, like other DLLs that are loaded into memory. And it will also configure the remaining uh, values, such as image DLL, uh, Boolean value, load notification values, the static import values. And it will modify all these values inside LDR data table entry to make it look like a legitimate uh, value. Uh, to, to make it look like a legitimate uh, a DLL that was loaded from this instead of a DLL that was loaded for module stomping. Now we can go in more into this in detail, but I have written a blog over here in uh, the v1.5 release, I think, of Brutal, which already contains a video uh, explaining all of this in detail. But my point being here that if you use uh, advanced module stomping, you will be able to evade the EDRs. So let me show you how. Let me. Uh, one second, I think someone is trying to join. Okay, so let me go back to my, uh, I'll exit this process. And I'll remove this so, that, so as to not be confused. Over here, I'll select, uh, I'll edit my listener actions. And oh yeah, I already have chakra.dll. I think this should be fine. So you can see I'm already stomping uh, chakra.dll over here. So now if I just simply execute my uh, initial shell code, right? Or even this WFS.txc, you get a connection back because since I've already stormed the module, we should be able to see it over here itself. So if I, uh, yeah, so I'll go to WFS, go to memory, refresh. You can see there is not a single RX region, which is unbagged. You can see all the RX region starts here, the end over here, and all of them are backed by a valid module. Let me put this to sleep zero to show you how it would look like for a stormed module. If I refresh, you can see we have chakra.dll with a 212 kilobyte, which is my Brutatel's shell code over here in this specific case. I'll go back and the moment I put this to sleep, let's say uh, one for, sorry, yeah, sample. And if I refresh this, let's say reread, you can see the whole content has been changed and it has been restored to the original values. If I do a refresh over here as well, you can see the original value has been restored again. If I open this up and open chakra.dll, for example, the original chakra.dll, which was stormed by me, Window, sorry, uh, chakra.dll. Close WFS. And if you go to its uh, section headers, dot text section, you can see these values over here, which we are actually checking. You can see CCCC and the exact same opcodes over here, which means whenever Brutal is not sleeping, it will, sorry, whenever Brutal is sleeping, 
it will restore the original contents of the dll so that if pc or any monitor or any uh, other areas like elastic which are known to scan the threads if they try to search for uh, any relation of uh, badges shell code via yarl rules into memory they will not find anything else at all however if you put your brutal into sock 0 or something similar at that moment the if you are into sleep 0 especially at that time even though the dll will still be stormed if i do refresh you can see that the value has changed and if i do a reread you can see that the value does not match the one that is currently there because this is my brutal shell code and this is the uh, value over here which is basically the original value but however when i whenever i go back to let's say sleep over here it will again restore its original value so if i do refresh you can see the value has changed Reread, you can see the value has been changed again if i also go back to let's say win dbg and take a look at its header values so file uh, attached to a process wfs if I type, let's say over here, exclamation PEB, this is the process environment block. This is my LDR uh, over here, P uh, ND exclamation underscore, uh, let's say uh, I'll type PEB underscore LDR underscore data. Can see these values over here this is our actual value and i'll type dt and exclamation square ldr data entry to see uh, what flags are for all the dls that we have and i'll also type exclamation list hyphen x to list everything from over here and uh, an offset of minus 10 and you can see all the DLS that are currently loaded. So if I search for, let's say, for example, uh, Akra.dll, uh, wait, I think I typed something wrong. One sec. LDR data table entry. Yeah. And if I search for Chakra, you can see over here that the entry point is still there. The image is uh, basically loaded uh, as a proper DLL and not as just any other generic DLL. If you do the same thing with Cobalt Strike, you would see this entry point is null. And the moment you see entry point as null and uh, the image DLL is basically zero over here, load notification is zero, you can simply scan its dot text section and you know it is going to be Cobalt Strike or any other stormed module in this specific case. I'll do a detach and I have my shell code running successfully over here itself. So, any doubts on this specific part? Uh, it would matter on what DLL you stomp because the badges shell code resides within the dot text section of the module that you're planning to stomp. So, if the badges size is like, like, let's say, 247 kilobytes, then the module that you're going to stomp should be at least 247 kilobytes or more than that. If it is less than that, then it won't be able to occupy the size of the badger shell code and that can lead to a crash so you have to it's always like and always make sure that the dll that you're going to stomp is not a dll required by the badger for example do not stomp win.dll or any other post exploitation modules that will be required by, by the badger because if the badger tries to load that dll later on it will again end up crashing so i would recommend doing a thorough test in your own um, uh, local lab before using it in an active engagement okay so going on to some of the next parts uh, if you understood everything till now the remaining parts should be pretty easy and not that complicated uh, parent child and process anomalies uh Brutal provides you a variety of options to do all of these things i would not recommend spawning any uh, child process or uh, let's say spoofing ppid because you can still use ppid by modifying the extended startup info uh, structure for a remote process that you're going to create. But EDS like Cobalt Strike, MD, ATP, Elastic, all of these detect modified PPID via ATW. There's a detailed blog as well, I think someone wrote quite some time back, which explains that if you modify the PPID of a process, then there you end up having a child process with two different uh, parent process IDs in this case, which can be anomalous in itself. It wasn't detectable quite some time back, but um, nowadays uh, Cobalt, uh, your, uh, sorry, it should be CrowdStrike, not Cobalt Strike, my bad over here. 
So CrowdStrike, MDATP, Elastic, all of these will be able to detect your uh, PPID spoofing most of the time. So I would not recommend using any PPID spoofing. Reflective DLL, BlueTotal provides you a load R API call. Uh, so load R command to load reflective DLLs into memory. I would not uh, recommend uh, loading reflective DLLs because again, it requires spawning a new process, calling or creating remote threads. Even though with BlueTotal, you can modify uh, how you want to inject. For example, you have the set underscore, uh, sorry, set uh, malloc and uh, set uh, threadx where you can dynamically change uh, these uh, API calls that you can use for remote process injection for your uh, sharp reflection, partial reflection, or anything else. It still can evade some EDRs, but when you're dealing with something like, again, Elastic or uh, let's say uh, CrowdStrike, it will most likely detect uh, these API calls. So I would recommend staying in your own process and using the variety of calls that are by default present in root retail instead of uh, going through uh, process injection in this case. You have .NET reflection. Brutal approach are two different ways to perform .NET reflection. One is via sharp reflect, and the another is via sharp inline. Sharp reflect can perform remote process reflections, and uh, sharp inline can perform local uh, process uh, reflection for your .NET code. Uh, when you perform sharp refle sharp reflect, it uh, creates a new process, executes the shell code into that, um, which executes your .NET code and gives you a response back. For example, over here, if I I'll type set malloc four which is uh, this indirect syscall and set threadx to let's say nine, which is NT create threadx syscall. And so this has been configured. Now I'll type sharp reflect. Yeah, I should have, uh, let's say, uh, my uh, sample C sharp files over here. So I'll just copy this, sharp reflect space this slash seedbell.exe. I think I might not have configured the child process, so it might give me an error back. Yeah, child process for four can run is not so I'll keep the process as let's say workfall.exe. Again, I would not recommend this unless until you are doing purple team. It should spawn, as you can see, it spawned a new thread, so a new process. My bad. This is the PID, this is the thread ID for the newly created thread, and it executed that and gave you a response back for the sharp effect. However, uh, if um, I would not recommend doing this because again, uh, remote process creations are easily detectable. I would rather recommend running sharp inline. So uh, the same thing if I execute via sharp inline, I do not require to create any uh, processes sharp inline. Use hardware breakpoints to uh, evade your ETW as well as your AMSI. And you can see there are no processes created over here. However, one thing to monitor over here is that whenever you load any C sharp executable in your process, it might, you can see that it won't show you up any anomalies, any uh, .NET assemblies like Seatbelt or something else because that has been patched by BlueTotal. It, it's not patched, it uses hardware breakpoints to evade them. But let's say if I go to the memory section and do refresh, you will see multiple RWX regions over here. And these RWX regions are not the RWX regions of root retail. These are the RWX regions allocated by your CLR.dll itself to uh, occupy your seat belt or something else and execute them. For example, even if I open PowerShell, and if I go over here and if I search for, let's say, PowerShell over here as well, then you will see these same RWX regions for PowerShell as well, as you can see over here. So the anomaly lies over here is uh, that lies over here is that, uh, for example, WFS.exe is not known to load CLR.dll and it is not known to generate RWX region. So that itself could be an anomaly. The RWX itself is not an anomaly, but RWX in a region which is not known to have RWX region can be an anomaly in this specific case. So I would recommend uh, only loading your C sharp executables into processes which are known to load your CLR.dll or something similar, especially if you are dealing with uh, CrowdStrike or uh, Elastic in this specific case. Uh, okay, any questions over here? Oh, let me see, no questions. So we'll go on to the next part. 
and sharp inline demo and finally we have our badger object files bofs which are nothing but your uh, similar to your beacon object files except that it has more um, easier ways to execute bofs because unlike cobalt strike which uses go and beacon parser to parse all the uh, command line arguments that you supply in and you, it uses quite a bit of gymnastics to achieve that in case of brute retail the entry point is similar to what you would write as a normal c code itself it's similar to your int main which takes int arg c arg v values except the entry point is uh, co a coffee because it's cough which is your common object file format so if i go back to a quick example over here we have boffs again all of these are present in your package when you download it but by default, we can see we have a very small example over here called as DECL test.c. Uh, it exports your imports your badger exports.h file, which is again present within your uh, brutal package. The naming conventions are same that of Cobalt Strike itself. It has an entry point over here, an argv, an argc, and a dispatch uh, wcar string, which takes all your output values and stores them. And you can see it's uh, not doing anything fancy over here, it's just using various API calls or brute tail to execute them into memory. So over here, I can do, let's say, badger underscore exports dot H. You can see all these values. Again, all of these are explained in detail into the blog, and I'm not going to go to them into detail in this seminar. I will be conducting a separate dedicated one where I'll be explaining each and every one of them along with their OPSEC values when we uh, take a look at that. Currently, if you want to just build the value, you can just do a DCC. ECL test hyphen C hyphen O, and I think I already have this object file present over here 64.0. Enter, and this object file I can simply execute this using the cough exec command within Twitter. Cough exec, the dash, uh, let's say uh, over here, it would be uh, sorry, my bad. OBJs as not box reflect, it should be DECL test dot sixty four dot O. And you can see it basically prints all these values. If I provide any command line arguments, like for example, this is a test, let's say, value, it should automatically uh, parse those uh, parameters, as you can see, and gives me uh, all the values over here. So it's pretty easy. The, end, the passing the entry point is uh, these values are similar to that of your uh, int main itself. Anyone who knows how to write C should find it pretty easy to write um, an object file over here itself. Similar to object file, you also have the memexec command, which can execute uh, various uh, executables. I am not sure. Let me see if I have Windows Sys internals over here, else I would need to download it. Uh, yeah, I don't have memexec over here. Sorry, uh, my sys internals toolkit. Let me just download that directly. Oh, sorry, my bad. Not download memexec. Sys internal suite. So memexec will simply take a uh, executable. Uh, read that specific executable from disk and execute that to memory without creating a new process. I'll copy this over here. Extract it. Okay, so let's so go and execute this via memory exec. Let's say home. Sorry, my bad. Sorry, my bad. Mem exec home documents. I think it's internals. We see the path where I copied it. Documents. Yeah, it should be sys internal suite. Suite. It, uh, let me see why it is not. Uh, one sec. I think there's some permission issue, so it's not copying. Let me copy this over here and execute it. 
Home patch documents handle. Uh, It's not auto completing that part. I think it's this uh, handle sixty four dot exe. So it basically prints all the handles over here. And if you take a look at, uh, if you start, let's say something like Sysmon or something similar, you would see that uh, there is no process creation at all over here. It just simply uh, reads this executable, uh, loads it reflectively within the current process, executes that, and gives you a result. And finally, there are also options for set module storm. Once you configure any of these modules, right, you can um, simply load any BOFs or your executables that you run inside the stormed DLL itself so that it has a valid call stack which originates from the DLL and not from a manually allocated region. Make note that all of these uh, are done within root retail with the using indirect calls and all sorts of opsec which is not a which uh, a lot of which i have not even uh, explained right now all of these will be explained in detail in the uh, documentation that i will be releasing by this weekend hopefully once it's complete which contains much more uh, in detail as compared to the ones that are present online but yes that's how you can execute uh, memexec and uh, yeah that concludes the seminar I would recommend going through these video links over here and uh, taking a look at each of these. I'll also be uh, uploading these uh, this specific uh, recorded video that we just recorded right now uh, in case anyone has any questions or doubts over here. But uh, does anyone else have any questions, any doubts, anything else? Feel free to post it right now in the workshop channel. Okay, so this was again just a, a starter workshop. Uh, I won't say workshop, more like seminar. So this was still a starter seminar. There's a lot more that will go into it in detail. I will be conducting more seminars, uh, most likely next month in the third week probably, uh, which will contain more towards um, your initial access as well as uh, post exploitation activities, what should be done, what should not be done. And if you want to gain much more information in detail, you can always go through the workshop links that I have. But uh, yes, I think that would be all from my end for this seminar. If you have any questions, anything else, feel free to ping me up. I'll, I'll just uh, upload the slides, uh, the uh, video and the content, the WFS.exe, the code and everything in probably one, one and a half hour on GitHub as well as on YouTube. So if you have any questions, anything else, feel free to uh, ping me up uh, on email, Discord, anywhere else, and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Cheers, guys. Have a nice day and bye.